Live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE. Covering Splunk.conf19. Brought to you by Splunk. Okay, welcome back everyone live in Las Vegas, the Cube's coverage of Splunk's.com. I'm John Furrier, host of the Cube. We're here, our seventh year covering Splunk.com. This is the 10 year anniversary for .com, and of course, security data is at the heart of the core cyber security challenges for enterprises and for public sector. We've got two great guests from SAIC, Tyler Williams, Principal Cybersecurity Analyst, and Karthik Subramanian, who's the Principal Senior Cybersecurity Engineer. Guys, welcome. Welcome to theCUBE, thanks for coming on. Thanks, thanks great to be here. So we were just talking before the cameras came out about cyber and you know, the global landscape. Obviously, the threats are everywhere, right? So general cyber is a couple things. There's national security in the US, you got overseas, it's digital, packets can come from anywhere. Yeah. This has been a huge challenge in managing this whole cyber. So you guys have a lot of experience on the public sector side and commercial. Yeah. What's your take, why are you guys here? What's going so, on here at .com? So in addition to what you said, and we have done a lot of hardening on things coming into our network, one of the biggest things that we've started seeing now are insider threats. Like for example, our customer, which is the FRTIB, the Federal Retirement Thrift Investment Board, they manage a $500 billion sovereign wealth fund for or you know, the retirements of federal government workers. That's a lot of billions, and you know, you in addition to protecting from outside, you want to protect from inside people either stealing people's data, stealing their money, or anything like that. So we're trying to provide that holistic cybersecurity of we're making sure that you know we keep people out, but we keep our data in, and that's yeah. what we're here. I, to I do. love that use case, so, uh, sovereign wealth, sovereignty. <laughs> yeah concept of sovereignty yeah. and sovereign wealth, obviously money's involved. Yeah. Insider threats are just as important. Yeah. And it's been talked about a lot, but has anyone really cracked the code on this? What are you guys doing? Because you know, anyone can walk out, they have a lot of human issues around passwords. Yeah. So how do you guys frame this? How do you guys look at the insider threat landscape and how do you guys attack that problem? Well, one of the great benefits of Splunk, obviously, is its capability to aggregate data uh, across the organization, across the enterprise. And so we can really identify user behavior and find deviations in that. And when they start to trend towards something that's negative, we can note on it. And so our SOC can take action as necessary. Well, one of the things on the notes here, you guys I see are doing a talk um, here at the event, detect and mitigate insider threats using Splunk's machine learning toolkit mm -hmm. and enterprise security, obviously they're shipping 6.0 yeah. availability. Yeah. What is that talk going to be about? How does Splunk play in all this? Can you unpack that? Because you know, people are talking more about the machine learning toolkit being, you know, kind of leaning on that heavily. Mm -hmm. Automation is certainly very important, but what does enterprise, what does enterprise security 6.0 bring to the table? So can you take us through the evolution of where you guys are at with, with Splunk? If you want to handle the enterprise yeah, security so, standpoint? Yeah, uh, generally enterprise security has traditionally had really, really good use cases for like the external threats that we're talking about. But like you said, it's very difficult to crack the insider threat part. And so we, leveraging the machine learning toolkit, have started to build that into Splunk to make sure that you, know, you can protect your data. And uh, you know, Tyler and I specifically did this because we saw that there was immaturity in the cybersecurity market for insider threat. And so one of the things that we're actually doing in this talk, in addition to talking about what we've done, we're actually giving examples of actionable use cases that people can take home and do themselves. Like we're like giving what? them Give an sample code of how to find some outliers. Like give an example of what So the use case that we go over in the talk is a user logs in at a weird time of day outside of their baseline and they exfiltrate a large amount of data uh, in a low and slow fashion. Um, but they're uh, doing this obviously outside of the scope of their normal behavior. So we give some good searches that you can take home and look at how how could I make a baseline? How could I establish that there's deviations from that baseline from a statistical standpoint and identify this in the future uh, and find the needle in the haystack using the machine learning toolkit? And then, if I have a SOC that I want to send notables 
to or some sort of uh, some notification to, how do we make that happen? How do we make the transition from machine learning toolkit over to enterprise security or however your SOC operates? And how do you do that? Do you guys write your own code for that or you guys yeah. use Splunk? There, so Splunk has a lot of internal tools and there's a couple of things that uh, need to be pointed out of how to make this happen because we're aggregating large amounts of data. Uh, we go through a lot of those finer points in the talk. Um, but sending those through to make sure that they're high confidence yeah. is, the, is the challenge. So you guys are codifying the cross connect yeah. from the machine learning to the other systems. All right, so I got to ask, this is basically pattern recognition. You want to look at baselining. Mm -hmm. How do people, can people hide in that baseline data? So like, I'll give, if I'm saying I'm an evil genius, I say, hey, I know these guys are looking for anomalies in my baseline, mm -hmm. so I'm going to go low and slow in my baseline. Can you look for that too? Yeah, there are. There absolutely are ways. Uh, fortunately, uh, there's a lot of different people who are doing research in that space uh, on the defensive side. And so there's a ton of use cases to look at. Uh, and if you aggregate over a long enough period of time, it becomes incredibly hard to hide. And so the baselines that we recommend building generally look at your 90 day or 120 day out, um, I guess, viewpoint. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So you really want to be able to measure that. And, and most insider threat incidents that happen occur within that 30 to 90 day window. Um, and so the research seems to indicate that those timelines will actually work. Now if you were in there and you read all the code and you did all of the work to see how all the things come through and you really understood the machine learning behind it, I'm sure there's absolutely a way to yeah, get yeah. in. If you're that sophisticated, but most of the times they're just trying to steal stuff and get out or compromise a system. Mm -hmm. um, so is there other um, patterns that you guys have seen in terms of areas that, that are kind of low-hanging fruit priorities that people aren't paying attention to, and what's the levels of uh, importance to, I guess, get a hold of or have some sort of mechanism for uh, managing insider threats? I was like passwords, obviously one, but I mean, like, what's um, the levels you know, of? There's been a lot of recent papers that have come out in lateral movement and privilege escalation. I think it's an area where a lot of people haven't spent enough time doing research. Uh, we've looked into models around PowerShell um, so that we can identify when a user is maliciously executed executing PowerShell scripts. Uh, I think there's stuff that's getting attention now that when it really needs to, yeah. but it is a little bit too late. Uh, the, the community is a bit behind the curve on it. Yeah, and C-sharp's becoming more of a pattern. So you're seeing a lot more C-sharp. PowerShell's kind of been hunted down, mm -hmm. kind of crippled or like identified. You can't operate that way, what we're seeing, but but is that an insider going to do that? Do insiders come in with the knowledge of doing C Sharp or is it going to come from the outside? So, I mean, what's the sophistication, I guess my question is, what's the sophistication levels of an insider threat? Depends on the level. Uh, so the CERT Insider Threat Institute has aggregated about 15,000 different events. And it could be something as simple as uh, a user who goes in with the intent uh, to do something bad. It could be a person who's converted from the inside at any level of the enterprise for some reason. Or it could be someone who gets you know, really upset after a bad review that might be the one person who has access. And he's uh, being to, socially engineered as well. Yeah. There's all Usually, kinds yeah. of different vectors coming in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so you know, in addition to somebody malicious like that, yeah. that, you know, there's the accidental, you're phishing campaigns, you're, yeah. somebody important clicks on an email that they think is from somebody else important or yeah. something like that, and you know, we're looking for, for that as well, and that's definitely. Spear phishing's been very successful. Yeah. That's a hard one to crack. It is. If they have that malware in there, looking at, yeah. say, HR data, it's, oh, this guy just got a bad review, good time to send him a resume yeah. or a job opening for, and that's yes. got hidden code built in. Mm -hmm. We've yeah. seen that move many times. Yeah, and natural language processing, and more importantly, natural language understanding can be used to get a lot of those cases out uh, if you're ingesting the text of the email data. Well, you guys are at a very professional, high-end firm, SAIC. I mean, the history, storied history goes way back. In a lot of government contracts, They're, they do a lot of the heavy lifting from anywhere from development to running full, big-time OSS networks. So there's a lot of history there. What is the state of the art? What do you guys look at as state of the art right now in security, uh, given the fact that you have some visibility into some of the bigger contracts, relative to endpoint protection or general cyber, what's the current state of the art? What's, what should people be thinking about or what are you guys excited about? What are some of the areas that are state of the art relative to cyber, cyber security, around data usage? So, I mean, one of the things, and I saw that there were some talks about it, but nat natural language processing and sentiment analysis has gotten, has come a long way. It is much easier to understand, you know, or to have machines understand what, 
what people are trying to say or what they're doing, um, especially, for example, if somebody's like web searching history, you know, and you might think of somebody might do a search for how do I hide downloading a file or something like that. Yeah. And, and that's something that, well, we know immediately as people, yeah. but you know, we have our customer, for example, has a billion, 1.2 billion events a day. Yeah. So, you know, if a billion of a uh, billion seconds, that's 30 years. Yeah. And so, like that's <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's, like, it's, it's a big number. Yeah. You know, we 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 hear those numbers thrown yeah. around a lot, but it's a big number to yeah. put it in perspective. So, Shoot. and we're getting that a day. Yeah, yeah. And so, how do we pick out? It's hard to step up that. that problem. You <laughs> yeah. can't step. You can't put step on that. Yeah. Yeah. Some of <laughs> the most cutting edge papers that have come out recently have been trying to uh, understand the logs, so having the machine learning understand the actual logs that are coming in to identify those anomalies, but that's a massive computation uh, problem, and it's a huge undertaking to kind of set that up. Uh, so I really have seen a lot of stuff actually at Conf here, some of the innovations that they're doing to optimize that, because finding the needle in the haystack is obviously difficult, that's the whole challenge, yeah. but there's a lot of work that's being done in Splunk to make that happen a lot faster, yeah. Yeah. and there's some work that's yeah. being done uh, at the edge, it's not a lot, but the cutting edge is actually logging, looking at every single log that comes in and understanding it and having a robot say, boom, check yeah. that one out. Yeah, and also the sentiment gets better with the data because yeah. we all cross those billions of events. Mm -hmm. You can get a you know smiley face or happy face, depending upon what's happening. It could be, oh, this is bad. But this, this comes back down to the data points. You mentioned logs, it's now beyond logs. They got tracing, other, other signals coming in across the networks. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's, a, it's a massive problem. You need automation. Yeah. You do. You got to feed the beast, yeah. right, the machines. And yeah. you got to do it within yeah. whatever <laughs> computation <laughs> capabilities you have. Yeah, I always say it's a moving train. It's hard, the target's moving all the time. Uh, you guys are staying on top of it. Um, what do you guys think of the event? What's the, what's the most important thing happening here at Splunk.com this year? I'd love to have both of you guys take a way in on that. Um, there's a ton of innovation in the machine learning space. All of the pipelines, um, really, that I've, I've been working on uh, in the last year are being augmented and improved by the staff that's developing content in the machine learning and deep learning space at Splunk. So, to me, me, that's by far the most important thing. Karthik, your, your take on this? Yeah, um, between the automation, I know in the last year or so, Splunk has just bought a lot of different companies that do a lot of things that now we can, instead of having to build it ourselves or having to go to three or four different people on top to build a complete solution for the federal government or for whoever your customer is, you can, you know, Splunk is becoming more of a one-stop shop and I think just up upgrading all of these things to have all the capabilities working together so that, for example, Phantom. Phantom, you know, giving you that orchestration and automation after, for example, if we have an ES notable event saying, hey, possible insider threat, maybe they automate the first thing of checking, you know, pull, immediately pulling those logs and emailing them or, or yeah. putting them in front of a SOC analyst immediately so that in, in yeah. addition to, hey, you need to check this person out, it's, you need to check this person out, here is the first five pages of what you need to look at. Oh, talk about the impact of that, because without uh, that SOAR feature, okay, the automation orchestration piece of it, a security orchestration automation piece of it, without it, where are you? No speed, what's the impact? What's the alternative? Yes, without so, SOAR? so when we're, right now, when we're giving information to our ES, our analysts through ES, they look at it and then they have to click five, six, seven times to get up the tabs that they need to make it done. And yeah. if we can have those tabs pre-populated or just have them, you know, either one click or just come up on their screen for once they open it up, I mean, it's, time is important, especially yeah. when we're talking about an insider threat who might The alternative be is not having lots nothing fast enough. Yeah, yeah and, and the alternative and, and is and a 5X increase in time spent by the SOC analysts. Yeah, and no one wants that. No. They want to be augmented <laughs> with the data. Data, yeah. ready to go, ready yeah. alert on it. All right, so final, you guys are awesome insights, walking data sets right here. Um, love the insight, love the, love the insight. So final question, for the folks watching that are Splunk customers or not as on the cutting edge as you guys pioneering this field, 
what advice would you give them, like if you had to you know, shake your friend, hey, you know, get off your butt, yeah, do this, do that. What, what, is the, what do people need to pay attention to that's super urgent that you would uh, implore on them? What would, you, what would your advice be? Why don't you start that one? All right, now, so. He's formulating an answer. Yeah, no, that's fine. Uh, one of the things that I would actually say is, you know, we can code really cool things, we can do really cool things, but one of the most important things that you know he and I do as part of our process is before we go to the machine and code the really cool things, we sometimes just step back and talk for a half an hour, talk for an hour of, hey, what are you thinking about? Hey, what is a thing that, you know, or what are we reading, what, and what are we learning? And, you know, formulating a plan, because instead of just jumping into it, if you formulate a plan, then you can come up with, you know, better things and augment it and implement it versus, a smash and grab on the other side of just, all right, here's a thing, let's let's dump it in there. So what you're saying is before you jump in the data pool yeah. and start swimming around, let's take a step back, collaborate with your peers or yeah. get some, you know, kind of a game Think plan. and plan. We spend a lot of hours whiteboarding, but I would to add to that, to augment that, we spend a lot of time reading the scientific research that's being done by a lot of the teams uh, that are out solving these types of problems. And sometimes they come back and say, hey, we tried the solution and it didn't work, but you can learn from those failures just like you can learn from yeah. the successes. So I recommend getting out and reading. There's a ton of literature uh, in, yeah. in that space around cyber. So always be moving, always be learning, always yeah. be collaborating. Yeah. Yeah, it's a moving train. Guys, thanks for the insights. Ep epic session here. Thanks for coming on and Thank sharing you your knowledge on theCUBE. theCUBE, we're running one big data source here for you, all the knowledge here at dot-com. Our seventh year, their tenth year. This is theCUBE's coverage. I'm John Furrier. We'll be back after this short break.